discussion for Math 3336, Discrete Mathematics, here at the University of Houston. Um, and our discussion was originally on divisibility. And in these notes, we're going to talk about the division algorithm, which I've started to write. And we're also going to talk about modular arithmetic. Okay, so <clears throat> the division algorithm is something that every student should see stated carefully, uh, especially students with a comp sci bend. Um, but we aren't going to go through a detailed discussion of its proof. <clears throat> um, but first, let's see a statement of what this says. Uh, it says, take any two integers, a and b, and just make sure a isn't zero. And what you're thinking here is you're going to try to, quote unquote, divide the number b by the number a. Okay, so rather than telling you what divide means, this algorithm, which isn't really an algorithm, it's just going to tell you something that happens. It says whenever you do this, whenever you pick an integer a and b, um, then there exist two other integers, I'll call them q and r, such that the following beautiful statement happens. b is pretty much a multiple of a, but you might have to correct it with this other integer r. Not only that, the integer r is positive and it's smaller than a. And I'm going to put the absolute value of a in case you picked a to be a negative number. So let's, let's first just understand this statement before we before I say anything about maybe it's proof um, or, or using it, uh, what is the statement really saying? This statement, as I tried to mention in the previous video, it's really saying, here's what you're thinking. You're trying to say, well, I'm trying to do B divided by A, and I might get some number, but I might get some remainder term. Now, what I've just written in purple here isn't usually the way we teach our students to think about division, but this is absolutely what happens. For example, if I do, oh, I don't know, um, oh, 16 divided by 6, right? Well, you guys might use to his thought, oh, we'll see, 16 will go in there like two times plus like a remainder of 4. Right. And what you really meant by a remainder of 4 is, you really meant it's 4 over 6. Is this equation I just wrote in purple true? Sure, multiply through everything by 6, and I get 16 equals 2 times 6 plus 4. This really does have the hallmark of setting up this long division right way back when 16 divided by 6 you would say okay it can go in twice and then I've got a remainder of 4 right so we're not used to emphasizing that we write our remainders as this number 4 over this number 6 uh, but that's actually what's happening and so let me erase some of this um, so this purple stuff here above, right, just like I did for 16 and the number 6, what I really want to do here is rewrite this so that I don't have any dividing going on. And what I can say is, oh, I can express this all in terms of multiplying and adding. Right, so if I'm going to define dividing, I should define it in terms of things I already am able to do, and we're assuming we can add and we're assuming we can multiply. Okay, this little condition here on the remainder, this makes the remainder, R, what we call unique. There's only one way um, to write to, to write B as A times Q plus an R. Um, and so I might as well highlight some terms here. This term over here, Q, 
is what we often would call the quotient. And R, I've already spoiled it, this is why it's actually called R, um, is what we would call the remainder. So really what's going on here is we are just writing more carefully one careful version of what it means to, to, to try to divide. Okay, so I want to make a few comments about this because like I said, I'm not going to go over the proof of this. So we're going to skip the proof, but I will say that the proof uses um, the proof is a bit more involved. It's a more involved proof than we've seen. And at some point, it uses the fact that um, the naturals are well ordered. So we mentioned that briefly in class before we had to take well, before we took spring break and then this long break, and um, being well-ordered is intimately connected with induction. Um, and what well-ordered means is there is a smallest natural number. It, you can say it a little more technically than that, but that's really, that's sort of the heart and soul of, of well-ordered. And that's absolutely crucial to induction, right? Because we needed that first smallest domino it'll knock over, if you will. Okay, so in addition to skipping the proof, I also want to comment on why is this an algorithm? An algorithm is usually defined to be a sequence or list of steps that um, starts with some given information and produces a desired result. So it's true, the statement of this quote-unquote algorithm, this is really a theorem, right? This, this should be called the division theorem. This isn't giving me a sequence of steps, but you can use this theorem to try and divide numbers, right? So this leads you, this theorem leads us to an algorithm, sort of as follows. If you want to try and divide b times b divided by a, and you think, um, maybe that's like a q, right, and you want to guess a number q, then you would need to figure out the remainder you would get. And you would say, okay, is this remainder smaller than a? If not, go back and pick a bigger q. And then repeat. If you then guessed a bigger Q, you'll get a new remainder, and then you ask, is this new remainder less than A? If not, go back and make Q bigger. And here you can kind of sense the sort of if-then, the conditional that would be built into this algorithm. So maybe to say this in a more concrete example, maybe we could try an example of how a computer program might try to implement this. We might try to do, oh, I don't know, 18 divided by 4, right? And so you might say, okay, I'm going to try and write 18 as some q times 4 plus an r. The theorem above says this is always possible. So now I'm going to start guessing q's. And you might guess, you might tell your computer, check q, I don't know, let's check q to be 1. Well, then we would have 18 would have to equal 1 times 4. Then I could tell the computer to figure out the remainder. The remainder would be 14. That's bigger than 4, so that's a bad guess. So I would tell my computer now, go to your guess and make it bigger. So I could say, okay, maybe Q is 2. Then my computer would say, okay, so this is 18 is going to equal 2 times 4. And then it would figure out the remainder would be 10. This remainder would be bigger than 4. That's a bad guess. I go to 3, and I know I am carrying this out. Um, 18 would then be 12 plus, oh, I could figure out my remainder. That'd be 6. Still bigger than 4. That's a bad guess. And so then I would guess Q equals 4. 
18 would equal 4 times 4 is 16, plus I would figure out the remainder of 2. Oh, I found a remainder that's positive um, and less than 4. So my algorithm would stop here. And so the whole point of this, the statement of this theorem tells you, you can tell your computer to start looking at these expressions. So it does give you a natural algorithm to start trying to divide numbers. All right, let me um, scroll up here for a second because I realized I miswrote something. Um, and I want to call attention to it. The remainder can actually be equal to zero. I said it was positive, but it can actually be equal to zero, right? So let's see a situation where that happens. So we can say, okay, here's an example. Maybe I want to do... I don't know, 27 divided by 3. So I'm going to say, okay, this Euclidean algorithm tells me 27 has to be expressible as q times 3 plus some r. And I won't go through the plugging guesses into your computer situation. Many of us can guess that q maybe is 9. And when I make that guess, 27 will be 9 times 3 plus r which will be 27 plus a remainder. So this remainder has to equal zero. And what's really happening here, when our remainder equals zero, right, we say, in this case, three divides 27, which is the same thing as saying 27 is a multiple of 3. So let me write this in a neutral color so it's not just about this example. More generally, if we have b equals a times q plus a remainder and r equals 0, so in other words, if I apply my Euclidean algorithm and find out that the smallest remainder I get is zero, then what I actually learn is b equals a times q. And that's the same thing as saying a divides b, which of course is the same thing as saying b is a multiple of a. Okay, so that's the sort of broad strokes of our division algorithm. Let me scroll up and add one more. Um, oh no, that's, that's, that's my comment that I wanted to add. So that's our division algorithm. Um, I think personally it is a little awkward to use it because we are not trained, at least in this country, to think of division in this way that this, this statement presents it. But this is exactly what division means to us if we really stop and think about it. This thing that I'm boxing, I'm saying, okay, you're going to try and take your number B and break it up into as many chunks of A as you can, Q chunks of them, and then write whatever's left over. Right? That's exactly what division is really doing. It's grouping B into some number of A's plus whatever you have left over. Okay, so let's maybe move a little bit ahead to a related topic, but it might not feel related right away, something called modular arithmetic. Okay, so I've got to define a symbol for us here. Definition. We're going to define what it means to say an integer a is congruent to another integer, I'll say c, mod n. 
So before I tell you what this means, let me just comment that A and C and N here in this expression are all integers. Okay, so notice we've used this triple equal sign before. We've used it when we were talking about logical statements being logically equivalent. So here I'm using that three line equal sign to mean something else or to be pronounced to mean something else and to be pronounced something differently. I'm not saying statement A is logically equivalent to statement C mod N. Whenever you see this three line sign being written this way, it's pronounced congruent. So this is A is congruent to the integer C and you can pronounce that mod. You could also say modulo the number n. So this is an old Latin word that's just kind of cool to say. And here's what it means. The meaning is as follows. Whenever you write a is congruent to c mod n, this means n divides a minus c. That's what this symbol and the words you use to pronounce it, that's what this all means. It means this. So let's try an example. All right, let's switch to, I don't know, maybe blue. Oops, wrong device. So let's try an example. I claim that three is equivalent or congruent. You could, you could use either word. I, I said congruent above. But three is equivalent to, oh, I don't know, 17 mod seven. And we could ask, is this true? Well, let's check. According to my definition, I wanna check does n, the number seven, divide a minus c? Does it divide three minus 17? That's really what I'm asking. I'm asking, does seven divide, when I simplify three minus 17, I get negative 14? And the answer to this question is yes, seven divides negative 14 since negative 14 is negative two times seven. Okay, so that's just one example. Let's maybe make a note here, sort of related example. Um, I could also just as easily argue that 17 is congruent to three mod seven. And let's think, because I did that work above in blue, I can, the work to check that this orange statement is true is almost identical, right? I can say, is this true? And what I'm really checking is, does seven, that's playing the role of n, divide 17 minus three? Is this dividing statement true? Okay, and hopefully you can see the connection between this orange question and this blue question, right? I'm really asking if, in one, if seven can divide negative 14, and in this orange one below, I'm just asking if seven can divide positive 14. And I hope it's clear that if seven can divide one, then seven can divide the negative of that one. So if you really think about what I've tried to um, get across in this blue and orange example, it doesn't take long to get to a more general fact about mod n stuff. 
And this says if a is congruent to a number mod n, that is equivalent. That's true if and only if c is equivalent is congruent to a mod n. And if you think about why this is a fact, really I could assign this as homework and say prove this if and only if. Suppose a is equivalent or congruent to c mod n, use that to prove c is a group equivalent or congruent to a mod n. If you really think about what these things are showing, this is just saying n divides a minus c. And this one over here is just saying n divides c minus a. So if n divides a minus c, then n divides negative a minus c. So this shouldn't be a very surprising fact. Okay, let's try another modulo example. Maybe we'll do this one in green. So an example. Um, what, what is three? Is three congruent to six? Oops, excuse me. I don't know why that happened. Is three congruent to six mod two? We could ask this question. Um, and hopefully you've paused the video, given yourself time to think. Uh, the answer to this is no. Right? If I look at three minus six, I get negative three, and this is not divisible by two. So the number um, six is not congruent to three mod two, and this leads to sort of a related example. Um, what numbers, what integers I should say, x is 3 congruent to mod 2. Let me write this in more mathy symbols. 3 is congruent to what numbers x mod 2? And if you don't like this way of writing my question, if you want the x to be, if you will, away from the words mod 2, the fact we mentioned above says, oh, this is the same thing as asking what numbers x is congruent to 3 mod 2. It's the same thing. And so what I'd like you to do is take a moment, maybe pause this video, and start checking. Start writing some numbers that are congruent to 3, let's say mod 2. One thing I hope you'll check is you'll find that 3 is congruent to itself, mod 2. Why is that true? Well, 3 minus 3 is 0, and 0 is divisible by 2. In fact, 0 is divisible by every number. Okay, so let's think about this. What are some other numbers that we can plug in for x here? We just found one, and so let me make a whole set of answers here. So one number um, that, we can, that we know is in our solution set, right? our set of values for x, here's what x can be. We just found that three is in this set. I don't know where to put it. Maybe I'll put it right there. When x equals three, we get a true mod two statement. And now I'm just going to start sort of spoiling some stuff. You should check that when x equals one. Nope, I don't know why I put that there. When x equals one, I also get something that uh, is equivalent to 3 mod 2. You can also check that when x equals 4, 
4 is not equivalent to 3 mod 2, and you can see that really quickly. When I subtract 4 and 3, I get 1, and 1 is not divisible by 2, so 4 is not in the set, but 5 is in the set, because 5 minus 3 is 2, and 2 certainly divides 2. And then you can start noticing, hey, 7 is in the set, because 7 minus 3 is divisible by 2, and 9 is in the set, because 9 minus 3 is divisible by 2. 11 is in this set. You can keep going. Don't forget to think about negative numbers. Negative 1 is in this set, right? Negative 1 minus 3 is negative 4. That's divisible by 2. Negative 3 is in this set. And if you start to think about this question, what are all the x's that are equivalent to 3 mod 2? There's infinitely many answers. Right, we just wrote down the, all the solutions in this set. X can be any odd number. And this maybe isn't so surprising because what does mod 2 mean? Mod 2, if you really think about my definition here, really refers to divisible by 2 and that's really what we mean by even or odd. So this innocent sounding little question, what x values are equivalent to 3 mod 2? sort of opens up a, a, a realization that modular arithmetic, at least mod 2 arithmetic, is all about thinking about evens and odds. All right, let's try maybe another example, and then I'll do some general properties of this, more general properties of this modular way of thinking. Um, another example, we might ask, okay, which integers y are equivalent or congruent um, to 1 mod 3. And we can ask, what can y be? What integer values can y be? I don't know why that little line went up there. OK, so again, I hope you can check pretty easily that y can be equal to 1, right? What is it really saying? We're, sa we're saying 1 is equivalent to itself, mod 3. This is the same thing as saying 1 minus 1. I didn't give myself enough room. Um, 1 minus 1 is divisible by 3. That's the same thing as saying 3 divides 0. Notice, I'm not saying 0 divides 3. That would be having like a 0 in the denominator. I'm saying 3 is a multiple of 0. Or I'm saying, sorry, um, 0 is a multiple of 3. I said that backwards. I'm saying 0 is indeed equal to some number times 3. And it is. It's equal to 0 times 3. So this question, what numbers can be congruent to 1 mod 3? Well, we found one of them, the number 1 itself. OK, I want you to check on your own that y cannot equal the number 2. That is, 2 is not equivalent to 1 mod 3. Similarly, y cannot equal to 3. That is, 3 is not equivalent to 1 mod 3. But as soon as we go to the next obvious guess, well, can y equal 4, maybe with a question mark, we're asking, is 3, I'm sorry, 3, is 4 
equivalent to 1 mod 3, and this is the same thing as asking, does 3 divide 4 minus 1? That's what this mod 3 thing means. Does 3 divide the difference? And the answer to this is yes. Okay, so again, for this question, which numbers, which integers y are congruent to 1 mod 3, let's just write down all of the answers we could possibly get and arrange them into a giant set of solutions. And I've noticed, well, 1 is in there, 2 is not in there, 3 is not in there, but 4 is in there. And then you can check. Y won't be able to equal to 5. That won't be in there. Y won't be able to equal to 6. Again, you can check these directly by saying, well, 6 minus 1, that's not a multiple of 3. But you will be able to check that when you plug in y equals 7, this will work. This will be in the solution set. And now you start to notice a pattern to the solution set similar to the pattern we looked at for the previous question. We see, hey, 1 is in the set plus 3 later is in the set, 4, plus 3 later is in the set, 7. You can start to guess maybe plus 3 later, 10 is in the set. That'll turn out to be true. 13 will be in the set, 16 will be in the set, and you'll keep going. But also, don't forget negative numbers, right? What would be the pattern continuing in this direction? Well, what number do we add 3 to to get 1? That is, what's 1 take away 3? That would be negative 2. And negative 2 take away 3 is negative 5, and then negative 8, and on and on and on. So it's kind of nice, right? Like these answers to these modular questions, we get a whole bunch of answers. We tend to get, we seem to be getting like an infinite collection of answers most of the time to these questions. But these solution sets seem to have patterns or structure. This solution set kind of looks like, I'll describe it maybe in red, as multiples of three all shifted by plus one. That seems to be what's in this solution set. And if you really think carefully about what I just said and wrote down and read, that should make a tremendous amount of sense. Because let's go back up to what we're saying here, to this original question. What integers y are congruent to 1 mod 3? We're really asking, what integers y are multiples of 3 when you subtract 1? So y isn't a multiple of 3, but when you take 1 away, it becomes a multiple of 3. That meant what sort of object, what sort of number did y look like? It had to look like a multiple of 3 plus 1 plus a remainder of one. And it's suddenly thinking carefully about these sorts of modular, excuse me, questions that gets this idea of modular congruence to be related to the division algorithm and specifically remainders. If you really think about all the answers in this solution set, saying I'm a multiple of three shifted by one, you're really saying when divided by three, you have a remainder of one. So what does it mean to say y is congruent to one mod three? You can think about this as saying, when I divide y by 3, right, so y is equal to some multiple of 3 plus a remainder of 1. That's what's being recorded here.
Okay, so we'll get back to that in a second, but let me now mention a few more facts about modular um, congruence. So facts about quote unquote mod in. All right, so I'm just going to put these in my order here. We already mentioned one fact, which is if A is congruent to, I'll say B now, B mod N, then, and um, this implies B is congruent to A mod N. In fact, what I said above was this goes both ways, of course. So I'm going to write down some additional words next to this. I'm not going to quiz you guys on these words, but I just want to equip you with this terminology in case you see it again in a future comp sci or math course. This property is sometimes called the symmetric property. What, what exactly am I saying is symmetric here? Well, this congruence mod n statement involves two quantities an A and a B. And what I'm saying is, if A is related to B, according to this new idea of being a congruent mod N, then you can flip B and A and you get a true statement. B is related to A. All right, there's another fact that I kind of mentioned in our explorations above, and that is every integer A is congruent to itself, mod or modulo any integer N. Right, why was this true? This was saying n divides a minus a. That is, every integer n divides 0. And that's always true. So another way of saying, um, an another sort of word for this second guy is to say that every integer a is congruent to itself mod n for any n, because n always divides 0. That also has another name. This is called the reflexive property. This relation of being um, congruent mod n, that's a relation. That's a way two numbers might be related. We say every number is related to itself. That makes it reflexive. And there's a third property which is really important. Here's what it says. If A is congruent to B mod N and B is congruent to C mod N, then A was congruent to C mod N. So really, I'm going to actually go through a little explanation of this fact, but I want to describe uh, uh, maybe an important way, could be important for future courses, uh, an important way to describe this property too. But let's just first off repeat what's being said. In, in, proper, in this fact three, I actually have three integers, four if you include n, but I have three integers, a, b, and c. And what I'm saying is if a is related to b, by being congruent mod n. And then if b is related to c by being congruent mod n, then it turned out a could skip past b, and you could say, well, a was also related to c. This property of two numbers, two expressions being related, and then that middle one being related to a third one, causing the first and last ones to be related, this is what's called the transitivity property, or being transitive. And if you think about the word relation the way we think about it in, in terms of human people, this makes sense, right? This kind of makes sense. If, if, uh, if my cousin is Bob, and if Bob's cousin is Cheryl, then Cheryl is my cousin, something like that. Maybe that works, probably works. Okay. So let's explore this transitive property for modular congruence. So I'll call this a proof of fact three 
but I, I'm not going to structure it um, too formally. So I'll put the word proof in quotes. So, you know, maybe I'll structure some of it formally. I don't know. So we'll say suppose A is congruent to B mod N and B is congruent to C mod N then of course what we want to show is that A is congruent to C mod N. And I can even clarify that. What does it mean? That is, we want to show that N divides A minus C. Right? I just reminded you in that parenthetical remark what A being congruent to C mod N means. Okay, so A congruent to B mod N, let's just apply the definition of this new term. That means N divides A minus B. And what does that mean? That means A minus B is some multiple times N. So I should point out there Maybe I'll switch colors just to be interesting. That k is an integer. Right? That's just what divide means. And then what does b being congruent to this third integer, c, modulo n mean? That just means n divides b minus c. And what does that mean? b minus c is equal to, I need some other letter, not k, I've used it, but it's some other integer times n. Oh, maybe, um, maybe an m. And so I should again also comment that m is some integer in z. Okay, so here's my trick, right? I would really, really like to show that n divides a minus c. So I'm going to start with a minus c and somehow try to write it as a number times n. And there's this great trick here that mathematicians love. I'm just going to add and subtract a number. I hope you guys agree that this was an okay thing for me to do. And so now I've got two numbers, a minus b plus b minus c. But of course, a minus b written above, that's just k times n, plus b minus c, that's just m times n. And so if I cleverly factor out an n, look what just happened. I just learned that a minus c is a new integer, k plus m, all times n. And this tells me this implies that n divides a minus c. Okay, so let's maybe explore what's going on here by revisiting some of those past ex previous examples. Let's go back up to this question here where I said let's look at this example y is equivalent or congruent to 1 mod 3. We said, what can y be? And I sort of rushed you through a lot of trials of guessing and checking, and then I kind of said, okay, we actually get a solution set like this, right? Um, this transitivity property we just sort of proved tells us something about this solution set. We can think of every um, every element in this set as being a solution to y is congruent to 1 mod 3. But by this transitivity property, I can also think of every element in this solution set as being y is equivalent to, and I'll pick not 1, I'll pick 4 mod 3. And why is this true? Well, first off, you can check. Is 7 equivalent to 4 mod 3? 
sure, 7 minus 4 is divisible by 3. Right? Is 16 equivalent to 4 mod 3? Sure, 6. Why was 16 in there? Um, yeah, sure, sorry. <laughs> Got mixed up. 16 minus 4 is 12, which is divisible by 3. Okay, so you can check that all of these numbers we originally wrote to satisfy this modular relation appear to also satisfy this one. But that makes sense because we already saw, and I'm going to write this in purple and then erase it, but we already saw that 1 was equivalent to 4 mod 3, right? That was how we found 4 in there anyway. But you could also say, but 1 was equivalent to 16 mod 3. And since 1 is equivalent to 4 and 1 is equivalent to 16, the transitivity property says 4 is equivalent to 16, too. So this transitivity property lets us think of this set of solutions in lots of different ways. I can say every element in this set is equivalent to 1 mod 3, but every element in the set is also equivalent to negative 5 mod 3. This is a solution set for lots of these mod questions. Okay, there's a couple other facts that are really important about modular arithmetic and using it. Um, so let's see, we're on maybe what I will call fact number four. That was my proof for three. Um, and here's what I'll say. If A is equivalent to C mod n and B is equivalent to C mod n, then, oh, sorry, I, uh, I don't know why I did that. Sorry, guys. Let me, let me start again. All right, so if A is equivalent to B mod N, and if C is equivalent to D mod N, then A plus B is equivalent or congruent to, sorry, let me back up, I'm getting all confused this afternoon. Okay, so if A is equivalent to B mod N, and C is equivalent to D mod N, then a plus C, maybe I'll highlight so I don't get confused, A plus C is equivalent to exactly what you think it is, is equivalent to B plus D mod N. And depending on how you want to think of this modular stuff, this is not that surprising. If you want to think of this modular stuff as, as we sort of indicated above, about remainders, what we're sort of saying is, if A can be said to have like a remainder of B when you try to divide, divide by N, and C has a remainder of D when you divide by N, then when you divide a plus c by n, and you say, what's the remainders? You can just add the remainders. We can write a technical proof of why this is true. Um, there's also nothing to stop me here from subtracting. a minus c is going to be congruent to b minus d mod n. Let's at least try this with an example. Hi, and welcome back. I Sorry, it probably wasn't an interruption for you guys, but my computer was acting up, so there's a little bit of a cut right here. But okay, so we're on this fact four about thinking about modular stuff. Um, and so we would have, uh, uh, we said that if A is congruent to B mod N, and if C is congruent to D mod N, then their sum or difference is congruent to B b plus or minus d mod n. Okay, so this is actually pretty nice, um, but
but let's just try a quick example of this. So an example we might have, okay, let me start with an A being congruent to B mod N. Maybe I'll start with four is congruent to um, three. Oh, I don't want to do that. Sorry, I said that backwards. Uh, four is congruent to seven mod three and nine is congruent to six mod three. So this is just one example. So let me sort of highlight this according to the colors I set up. What's playing the role of A is four. What's playing the role of C is nine. And what's playing the role of B is seven. And D is being played by six. So what we have here, if, if this fact is true, then four plus nine should be congruent to seven plus six mod three. And this certainly follows because four plus nine is 13 and seven plus six is 13. 13 is definitely congruent to itself. But let's try the difference. Four minus nine should be congruent to seven minus six uh, mod three. So let's see what this looks like. Four minus nine is negative five, and that should be congruent to one mod three. And we can check, this is definitely true. Negative five minus one uh, is negative six, and that is a multiple of three. Okay, so this fact works in general. Um, there are some other facts I can expose you to, but what I'd like to do is end this video, uh, maybe working out a few examples, we'll see how time is going, but um, I'd also uh, like to sort of warn you, I guess, um, about some of the way our book and maybe some of your friends in the other sections um, use, use this notation. So um, let's see, um, or I should say use similar notation. So one bit of notation to be careful about, so some notation to look out for is the following. When somebody just writes B mod N. So I'm not saying A is congruent to B mod N. What does this mean? This notation, I'll put a little bullet here. This means the remainder obtained when dividing B by N. So for example, if I wrote five mod three, there's no congruent sign, but what I'm saying here is, oh, this is two, right? Because five, is equal to one times three plus a remainder of two. That's R. So this is always positive. So that's one one thing to, to keep in mind. Um, as a result of this, though, um, uh, give me a second. Um, if you if you uh, this notation can be a little bit confusing because now when I look at the notation A is congruent to B mod N, that is not the same thing 
as saying a is equal to this remainder b mod n. All right, so I'll just give you one example, maybe in a different color to sort of spice this up. Um, we could have, oh, I don't know, 8 is congruent to 5 mod 3. That is true, because 8 minus 5 is divisible by 3. But this is not the same thing as saying 8 equals 5 mod 3, that is 8 equals 2. That's not the same. It would be the same, I can say this, if a is congruent to b mod n, that is the same as saying a is congruent to this positive remainder b mod n. So when most people talk about modular arithmetic, they're talking about First, reducing a number mod n as much as possible, making this thing I'm underlying the smallest positive or non-negative number you can. That's the remainder when you divide by n. And so it would really, um, really, I, I, it would be more common to say, well, not that 8 is congruent to 5 mod 3, that's true, I w it's more common to say 8 is congruent to 2 mod 3. I'm not saying that one's more accurate, it's just more common. Okay, so that's a little bit of notation I wanted to sort of put on, on our radar. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to sort of end with is this statement that also deals with this. Um, so we sort of noted in an example above, right, the definition for being congruent mod m was this means that n divides b minus a. And we sort of commented on this on one of those solution set examples I worked through. This also means that the remainder of a when you divide by n is equal to the remainder of b when you divide by n. Okay, so that's, that's just, again, I'm just writing down something we started to discuss. Um, and we'll start to discuss some future things in a, in a next video. Um, so coming up will be the following. A brief discussion on prime numbers. And then a, uh, a bit more, looking more carefully into solving equations like a times x is congruent to b mod n for x. And it could be that as we saw sort of equations like this was when a was 1, um, uh, today in, these, in this video discussion, it could be that there are lots of solutions to these, it could be that there are none, maybe, it could be that there is one. Right? It all sort of depends on the relation between a and b and this number n. Okay, so this is a good place to stop the video. I am going to add some additional optional talking here. So I'll just call this some um, additional insight. I don't know how helpful this will be for um, the problems that I'm assigning. Um, so take this with a grain of salt. If you don't have time, I completely understand you're stopping the video here. You're not going to miss much. But if uh, if you want to use this video to help go to sleep, maybe keep it running. But okay, here's sort of an additional discussion that goes a little more in depth um, about what's going on with this notion of being congruent mod n. So we talked about 
a being congruent to another number mod n really means that n divides b minus a. These, this is the definition of all this stuff. And we can sort of see how this is useful. This ties into really thinking about the remainders of a and b. So that's my term for the remainder of a when you divide by n, and the remainder of b when you divide by n. If you will, the leftovers when you divide by n are all the same. Right, so let me just write down one example, maybe in blue, maybe 6 is congruent to, oh, I don't know, uh, 8 mod 2. Uh, you know what, let's do a more interesting one. 6 is congruent to 10, maybe mod 4. And that would be the same thing as saying 4 divides b minus a or a minus b, so 10 minus 6, which is true. But that's the same thing as noting that the remainder of 6 when I divide by 4, that's 2. That's the same thing I get as the remainder of 10 when I divide by 4 which is also 2. Okay, so that was all that. So um, right now, it is kind of interesting, in the next video discussion, we'll get to solving those ax is congruent to b mod n equations, and those are interesting. But what I want to talk about here is why really would we define this notion of being congruent mod n? First off, what is even with this phrase, mod n? Why do we even say this? Well, I actually haven't looked up the Latin for this in a while, so I've actually forgotten it, but the real word isn't mod, it's modulo. That's a Latin word. And what it means in practice is ignoring. So I've actually heard a few people, a few overeducated folks, accidentally use this in everyday education, uh, sorry, everyday conversation. Um, they might be talking about, well, you know, modulo a few facts, this is the way this works. I, and what they're saying is, ignoring some certain things, this follows. So when we say mod n, we're really saying ignoring the number n. And we really mean this in a sort of multiplicative sense. What I mean by that is I mean ignore multiples of the number n. Right, so when I say something like 6 is congruent or equivalent to 10 mod 4, what I'm really saying is ignoring multiples of 4, 6 is the same as 10. And that makes, to my way of thinking, that makes a little more sense in terms of what this is meaning. I can even view this on like a standard old school number line. So maybe there's zero, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten. And so what do I mean by ignoring multiples of four? Ignoring multiples of four means, okay, visually speaking, anytime I see four consecutive spaces on this line, I can pretend like they're not there. So like there's one, two, three, four, right? So this number here, maybe I'll write it in blue, four is a multiple of four away from zero. So those two are kind of declared to be the same. Now they weren't originally the same number. So I'm gonna acknowledge I have different symbols for them, 
but I'll say they're the same if I ignore multiples of 4. Similarly, if I count how many spaces there are between 6 and 10, there's 1, 2, 3, 4. So what happens here is these two used to be different, but if I put on my mod 4 goggles, I say, oh no, these are now the same, or they're equivalent or congruent, ignoring multiples of 4. And so let's see what this does. Let me sort of repeat this picture a little. What I'm going to do, oh gosh, I put way too much room, but okay, there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, let's, let's play this game of what happens visually if we start to ignore multiples of 4, right? What things, we're going to color code it, what marks on my number line get declared to be the same? Okay, so I'm going to color code with a highlighter. So let's do green, and let's say, okay, what are all the things that get declared to be equivalent or congruent to zero? Well, you move four away in the right direction, say, okay, this guy is four units away, it's a multiple of four away, and then four units away in the right again, I would get an eight over here. What else gets declared to be the same as zero, congruent to it? Move four to the left, I get to negative four. And if I had left enough space, there would be like a negative eight over there. Okay, now let's switch colors. What's everything in this picture that got, um, that gets declared to be congruent to one? You say, well, let me ignore multiples of four. So let me move four spaces over, plus one, two, three, four, five is going to be said to be the same as one. And then let me move four spaces to the left, one, two, three, four, three, negative three is going to be the same as one. And let me move four more spaces to the left, one, two, three, four, negative seven is going to be declared to be congruent to, to one. And now you can start to see what's going on here. If I play this game, oh, let me try, uh, oh, I guess I'll go blue. If I play this game at two, then four units to the right of two, I get to six. And four units to the left of two, I get to negative two. And four units to the left of that, I get to negative six. And we'll play this fun coloring game one more time. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to pick a color that's not too hard to see. We'll try red. If I start at 3, and I say, okay, I'm ignoring multiples of 4, so I do one multiple of 4 to the right, that is move 4 units over, 1, 2, 3, 4, and I get to 7. If I move one multiple of 4 to the left, 1, 2, 3, 4, I get to negative 1, and then I get to 1, 2, 3, 4 negative 5. And the point is, if it were possible for me to draw an infinite number line, you would see this colorful pattern continue all the way forever to the left and all the way forever to the right. So in maybe another math course, um, we might look at what we call the, the equivalence or congruent, congruence classes. Um, or equivalence classes. And what this is saying is, hey, pick one of your favorite integers from your number line, and let's say you picked the integer 0. And you're going to say, okay, the integer 0, write down all the things that were equivalent to 0 when you're ignoring multiples of four, and it's this entire set of things, right? So I get this whole set containing zero and all of the stuff it's equivalent to. So it's an infinite set, all the multiples of four, but what I'm gonna do is say, okay, that's, that's my green set. All my green guys are in that one set. 
And then I could say, okay, what's what about what's equivalent to one? Let's put all those in their own collection. And that would be all these orange guys. And let me just do this a couple more times. If I did the uh, red ones, oops, I kept the wrong marker. I could say, all right, put all the red guys in the same set because they're all they're all equivalent to each other mod four. They're each multiple of four away from each other. And then the blue elements, I could just collapse into their own collection. And so look what we did here. By ignoring multiples of four, we took our infinite, doubly infinite line of integers and said, well, if you ignore multiple of four, that doubly infinite set of information now really only has four things in it. Blue things, pink things, green things, and orange things. This ignoring multiples of four collapsed what used to be different numbers and said, hey, you're basically the same because you guys are the same color. Let's not make a racist comment here. <laughs> it kind of feels like there's a, a terribly politically incorrect joke to make here. But all that's happening when you're ignoring multiples of four is it collapses information. Zero and four used to be different. Now they're both the same because they're a multiple of four apart. Zero and 24 used to be different, but they're the same because they're also a multiple of four apart. So looking at integers, looking at integers mod four, simplifies the integers. There used to be infinitely many different integers, but when you look mod four, there's only four different types that you could ever care about. So we went from infinity to four. Not only that, you could do this for not just mod four, but mod five, or mod six, or mod 20 million, right? And it will create a similar situation. So this idea of ignoring things mod 4, um, it has other uses too, and I'll, I'll describe them, but in a sort of more abstract math direction, what's going on here is mod n is a computationally friendly, it's not too hard to compute with this concept, so it's a computationally friendly example of what's called equivalence relations and equivalence classes. And these two are just more general versions of this mod n concept, right? To talk about mod n, I had to talk about integers, I had to know how to add them, and I had to know how to multiply them. I, and I also needed, really, some sort of division algorithm. Well, this notion of equivalence relation and equivalence classes, those guys work when your sets are sets of random things that you don't necessarily know how to add or multiply. You can define versions of this mod n technique in these other situations. Okay, so why in so I think I hope this gives you a sort of colorful view of what's what uh, of maybe a, a simultaneously deeper and simpler look of what mod n is doing. But there's still this question of why would we do this? Um, and so why why ignore a multiple of n? And actually, this happens a lot, right? We do this every day. In particular, we do this, let me start a little more general than a day, we do this pretty much every year. 
So if you ignore leap years, right, um, we sort of, our calendars sort of work in terms of days, mod 365. If I say, hey, in 365 days from today, you're going to get a million dollars, what I'm saying is, in one year, you're going to get a million dollars. Right? So once I get 365 days away, right, I'm right, I'm at the exact same date. I'm at March 31st or whatever today is. Um, our months, right, are kind of done mod 12. Not kind of, they actually are. Right? If I say, hey, this month is April, 12 months from now, it's still April. Right? So that's kind of like ignoring one multiple of 12. You're calling it the same month again. Even if you get down to just the way we tell time, right? Minutes, we do mod 60. Is that right? Something like that. Um, I'll, I'll say this. I'll, I'll just cut to the chase here. For clock arithmetic, Um, clocks are done mod 12. 12 hours from now, it's going to be, uh, I don't know, it's going to be 3 a.m. So all I'm pointing out is that mod n, this ignoring chunks of n, maybe it's chunks of 365, chunks of 12, um, uh, is something we naturally do because mod n is really capturing cyclic or repeating phenomenon. So anytime something you notice something repeating, your brain is doing some sort of modular process. Right? If I scroll back up to my colorful example above, I notice the green color repeats every four spaces. So does the orange color. So does the blue color, right? right? So if I had colored this in mod 12, that would kind of correspond to my months repeating after every 12 months. So modular um, mod n congruence is a very natural thing to impose or to think about mathematically because we deal with it on a regular basis. Lots of things exhibit repeating or cyclic behavior. And so that's one reason to think about this. Um, this modular arithmetic comes up a lot. All right, it also comes up in computer science, right, for different sort of programming tasks. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for you guys to think more about or relate to your other actual courses. Um, I just want to make this last note on maybe equivalence relations, because these really do pop up in other math courses. We could talk about them in our course. I'm not going to this semester, but they definitely pop up in Math 3325, because then they get used in abstract algebra. Um, they even eventually get used in some higher up analysis courses and topology courses. There's all sorts of math that needs to speak this language of equivalence relations. And mod n is your first example of what we call an equivalence relation. So um, I just want to give you an analogy of an equivalence relation, so then I can shut this video off. So what is an equivalence relation? Well, it's when you start with a set of stuff. And in a math course, right, this might be an infinite set, maybe a set of numbers, a set of things that I care about. But maybe for my example, maybe I'll think of it as a set of Legos, because Legos are great. So I wish my set of Legos were infinite, but we can think of them as large but finite set. 
Okay, so an equivalence relation, it's usually written, written with a wiggle sign, we're going to say two elements in the set S, right, we'll write A wiggles B, or A is related to B, and you have to define this. You have to say this means, and you give me a condition. So in my example, I'll say Lego A is related to Lego B means um, A and B are the same color. Right, so depending on what your elements are in your set, you can try to define this relation in some way, by some formula or some property. And here's the three things you want to be true about your relation. One, you want every element to be related to itself. That's one thing you want. So over in my example about Legos, is it true that every Lego gets declared to be related to itself? Is this true for every Lego? Is it true that every Lego is the same color as itself? Yes. Okay, the second property you want for your relation is that if an element is related to a second element, then they switch the order of their relation. The second one is related to the first. This lets me talk about A and B being related without having to specify an order. I just say A and B are related, and you could hear that as A is related to B, or you could hear it as B is related to A. It's the same thing. So over here, is this true in my Lego example? If A and B are the same color, does that imply that B and A are the same color? The answer is yes. The last thing you want this special relation, this wiggle sign, to satisfy is that if A is related to B and B is related to C, you want it to follow that A is related to C. So our third statement here for my Legos, if A is the same color as B and B is the same color as C, does it follow that A is the same color as C? In this example, yes. So why would we ever set up something called an equivalence relation in general? What's the use of this thing? The use of it is that this wiggle equivalence relation breaks up slash organizes your big set S into a collection of easier to understand subsets. So let me show you how that works in my example over here. What do I mean by this? So I've got S is this gigantic set of Legos. There's all different Lego pieces in here, and I'm not doing a good job with it, but they're all different colors. Maybe if I can get my act together, I'll post a picture of all my Legos, well, some of them, downstairs that my wife loves that I have in our kitchen. Okay, so here are all some different colored Legos. So what happens when I think about my is the same color equivalence relation? Well, now I can use this equivalence relation to organize this set and say, okay, pick my favorite um, Lego piece. Well, I'll just pick this one at random, the one I circled. Now, group, regroup the elements. Get all the elements that are related to that one I circle, put them in a pile. And so that's all my blue ones. And now, pick a different element, maybe this black one here. Put all of the, the other elements related to that black piece in a pile. And do the same thing for all the other pieces. So there's red. And now let me try orange. And then green. And 
And so what happens is rather than looking at my set S as a whole bunch of mixed up elements, I can group these guys together in what's called their equivalence classes. And rather than look at all these different mixed up things, I can look at this, in this case, this finite collection of equivalence classes. And that's what an equivalence relation does in general. You can break up your abstract set into, okay, the subset everything that's related to one element. Group them all together. And then another subset, everything else that's related to some other element. And these these collections, right, um, these collections won't overlap. Because if they overlap, well then by the transitive property, property three, they've got to be the exact same thing. Another good analogy I like to use here is uh, like breaking up the students at Hogwarts according to what dorm they're in. I'm going to say two Hogwarts students are equivalent. They're related if they're in the same house. So is excuse me, is Harry related to Ron? Yes, they're both Gryffindors. And then what I say is, okay, group all the students in Gryffindor, put them there. And then group all the students in Slytherins, the best one, put them there. Then all the Hufflepuff people, well, the Hufflepuffs are pretty great too. Um, and then the other one, Ravenclaw, effing nerds, right? Those houses don't overlap. You don't have a student that's both a Gryffindor and a Ravenclaw. Right? They are neatly arranged into non-overlapping packets. These packets are called equivalence classes. And going back to my Lego example, it might really give you the sense that it's easier to look at this collection of packets than it is this mess. And mathematicians are able to set up these equivalence classes and via these equivalence relations uh, in lots of different scenarios. One of the most important scenarios is in a class called abstract algebra or group theory. Um, this is how you set up something called factor groups. Uh, another really important use of this is in topology. Okay, but let's rewind a little. These properties I mentioned to you about equivalence relations right here of course, I, I think you'll remember that this third one, I already spoiled it, that's your trans oops, that's your transitive property. And your second one, um, oh, I think I remember I wrote these out of order. This is your um, reflexive property, or sorry, symmetric property, I said that wrong. And this one up here is your reflexive property. And if you notice, these were three of the four facts I mentioned about mod n several minutes ago. Okay, all of this was sort of unnecessary. Um, if you decided to pay attention, I hope it helped. But you'll notice that our homework over this material is a bit more computational. Um, and so you don't need to think this abstractly about things, but I'll save these notes and upload them. I hope you guys are doing well, and I'll talk to you again soon.